All right, everyone, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm really excited about this book study because um, like probably like many of you, you have books sitting on your shelf and you never you never actually open them. So um, so now I get to open it and study it. And I'm really excited because um, this book has been mentioned in the Kilpatrick book as one of the um, interventions that has shown good results, correct? Um, mm -hmm. And if you're curious about that, I had marked the page. It is on page 319 in this book. So uh, phonographics, it's um, the results are as strong as the studies. Not every study using phonographics has had results as strong as in the studies reported in this chapter, but that's, you know, so that's the, so I, I'm really excited about this because I think, you know, it's supported by uh, Dr. Kilpatrick and um, it's also the, um, the genesis for two other reading programs that are currently out there. So um, it's all good. So we are fortunate to have Erin Duncan here and she is now the, uh, the CEO of the Phonographics Reading Company. Uh, she is a linguist, a writer, and a veteran reading therapist with over 30 years of clinical reading remediation experience. She's taught thousands of clinical hours to students of all ages and challenges, managed classroom literacy instruction and reading assistance projects, and has trained hundreds of teachers, specialists, and parents from around the English-speaking world. And her mission since taking over phonographics in 2014 is to open the door to literacy for everyone through this new paradigm of reading instruction, proven, efficient, multi-sensory instruction based on clinical experience and research in the fields of reading, cognitive psychology, learning theory, child development, motivation theory, and linguistics. So without further ado, Erin, welcome. Thank you, Donna. I, I, I appreciate you inviting me here and everybody who's here, who's um, joined us or registered and plans to watch the recordings later. Um, I was very excited when Donna invited me to do a book study of Reading Reflex um, because I know so many parents have used this book to help their own children. And I would love to put it in as many hands as I can get it in um, for that reason, because it, I know it changes lives. So um, when Donna asked me to do a book study, I wasn't quite sure what a book study would look like. So I'm hoping I hit the mark. If not, we can make adjustments for next time. But, um, and before we get started, I did want to um, acknowledge that, you know, the tone of this book is, is striking and, and it's difficult for some people. It was written in the 1990s. And at that time, it was clear we were failing kids. Um, they were failing to learn to read. Um, but very few people were actually looking critically, really critically at what we're doing instructionally that contributes to reading failure. And so we, we needed frank and forceful voices um, to start any kind of change. And there was, and there still is quite a bit of pushback, um, both institutional and corporate um, to the changes that we're all asking for to embrace the science of reading in, in classrooms and, and at home and in clinics. But from reading posts here at the, at the Facebook page, I can see that the struggle to affect this change continues. So I would just suggest we don't worry about the tone of the book and just focus on the content of it, which people, as I said, are using around the world to change lives uh, for the learners in front of them. And I wanted to note that I've seen some great posts and resources here at the, at the website, um, the Facebook um, site, I mean, sorry about that. And you can use those to help your colleagues understand the science of reading and see why it matters. You can find out what you should and shouldn't be doing in, in reading instruction. So in this book study, we're gonna be looking instead at, well, how you do it. If we make this shift in instruction, what is it going to look like? And 
I love this book because its focus is tightly on how you can harness the science of reading to teach the learner in front of you. Oop, and here we go. Oop, there we go. And I, um, as Donna mentioned, I did, or may have mentioned, I did a presentation of the phonographics method in January, just an introduction talk. And I, you can find a recording of that at the Facebook page. We discussed the science of reading principles and looked at a bit of how phonographics put those into action. And I wanted to note that you'll hear me use a couple of terms. Phonographics is the name of the methodology. Reading reflex is the name of the parent program for phonographics. In order to ensure that parents are successful, what we'll learn here from this book is slightly different from the student-driven and more efficient phonographics classroom and clinical program that you'll find presented in the certification course and materials. But I think this is an excellent starting point for educators too. You can pilot the program with a student or two to see it in action and from start to finish in this simpler version. And later you can use the book to explain things to your students uh, and their parents. Um, and I wanted one other point to bring up is that phonographics is used to teach all ages. The, the larger methodology. The Reading Reflex book is geared toward primary age children, but we're lucky we can be together, we can discuss things. And um, if we wanna discuss how, how these same lessons would work with older students as we go along, we can do that. So our schedule for the book study is to meet several times Today we'll discuss chapters one and two, uh, where reading is explained and getting started. And we'll be walking through the book and I'll be sharing my thoughts and experiences and demonstrating things. And I hope to save time at the end of every meeting for discussions so we can answer questions and things like that, or just discuss things. Next week, we'll, we'll look at the next two chapters where the instruction actually starts. So at that point, you know, we can be starting with your students um, and or your children at home. We'll take a week off, which is actually good because that gives you more time to implement things. And then the following week, we'll look at the next chapters and continue the instruction um, the following two weeks. And then the final week, we'll be done with the book, but you may not be done with your instruction. So I thought it would be good for us to go look at where we might go from there, how you might continue to work with your student at home, or if you're a classroom teacher, how you might uh, put this to work in small groups or in whole class instruction, or actually doing tier one and tier two in instruction in the classroom, or tier three instruction if you're a specialist. So, the first chapter, we're just gonna hop in through it and start, start sort of walking through the book. The first chapter is about reading and explaining it. And I really like the book in that it incorporates a lot of uh, stories and examples of, of the method in action. Um, and it starts with the story of Jack, who's an adult that the author had been working with and discusses the impact of reading failure on his life. Um, it made me think, of course, of my own journey with, with reading instruction. So I thought I might share that a little bit with you. I began teaching reading remediation clinically while I was in graduate school. I was studying former, formal linguistics and I worked at that clinic for about 10 years using a, a great method, a proven method. Um, but there was always a puzzling mismatch for me between what the linguists were saying in my graduate courses about what we know of language, what's innate there, what everybody knows in order to be able to speak, knows in a, in a deep rooted sense versus what the 
reading and program we were doing was teaching. There was quite a mismatch between the two. And that always puzzled me. And then the other thing that concerned me during that time, those first 10 years of reading, reading um, remediation in a clinical setting was that I had to struggle so much with attrition. Keeping parents and children motivated to keep going through the grind, through hours and hours of instruction. And the, a common refrain was, well, what does this have to do with reading? So one day a colleague of mine asked me to read Why Our Children Can't Read and What to Do About It by Diane McGinnis. And I found so many answers in there. Um, it was one of those just eye-opening books that just I read <laughs> start to finish, I think in one day, um, because it, I, it just answered so many of my questions. And I know there are a lot of, of, of books like that that you find now and that are posted at the Science of Reading website, you know, things like the logic of English and all those things. But in the book, they referenced phonographics and the Reading Reflex book. So I read that again in a day and then booked a flight to Florida to get certified in the methodology from the authors of, from, from Carmen and Jeffrey McGinnis. And I came back with so many answers and, and also such a flexible tool, much more flexible than what I had been working with for years. Um, so much so that I could take this intense clinical work and use it in small groups for reading intervention in classrooms. I could do it with whole class instruction. I started working with the brand new readers, which was so fun because the methodology I was using, there's just no way you could use it to teach a kid to read from, from the get go. They were too young. Um, and I also could work more, much more effectively with the teens and the adults. So my first adult non-reader was very much like Jack, who's in the book um, here at the beginning of chapter one. Um, like him in the profound and long-term effects of the experience of reading failure um, and in the impact the phonographics instruction had for him. So stories like theirs are what keeps me going. And as we continue through the book on page four, you'll find some staggering numbers. When I read them for the first time, I, 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 was, I was truly appalled. Uh, I'm not going to summarize them here. You have them all written in the book. Um, and when we start going through them, folks always want to quibble on the exact definitions of literacy or competency or reading, about what was tested, about which tests were used, or what a newer study might show. I don't think all those details are really that important in the big picture the consequences of reading failure are, are, are devastating. I don't want that for my child or for yours. And as a society, we can't afford to have kids failing to learn to read. And no matter how you look at it, no matter what the numbers show, I find the number of kids who fail to read well enough to keep their options in life open, I find it appalling and unacceptable. So the question we're left is, why is this happening? And what can we do to change that? How can we change it? So the first section of, the, of this chapter then goes into um, an examination of the history of English reading instruction. And the, the section lays out the issues of phonographics and instruct, I mean, sorry, not phonographics, phonics instruction in such a clear way. It's worth reading and rereading and reading again later after you've, after you've done some of the lessons. And it's worth, worth us taking some time to walk through right now, I think. So in the 1700s, Webster's blue-backed speller uh, was used and that's when phonics was born. And in it, children memorized the sound each letter makes, and then they memorized rules for combining letters for words like rain, where an A and an I only have one sound that's happening. Um, and the, 
then they found, oh, there were lots of exceptions to the rules. So the students then memorized all the exceptions to the rules. Well, this se section of the book then goes on to discuss the, the real problems with this. So first, when you're asking kids to memorize the sound each letter makes, well, what we've got there is a paired associate learning where you've got arbitrarily associated pairs. It's very difficult for young children to do, but it's aided by making the two associates meaningful. So I love how in the book they talk about language learning and how the spoken word drink gets associated with the item um, that appeased a need. And that was quite a meaningful combo. And that's how, what drives kids to learn language and learn thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of paired associates, arbitrarily paired things, the, the spoken word and the thing it represents. For letter learning though, there is no relevance for a sound alone. It's only meaningful when it's placed in a word, but phonics teaches the sounds of the letters for a very long time before ever teaching how to read or spell a word. In my own experience, those first 10 years of clinical instruction, I recall regularly spending 10 hours or more. And these are intense one-on-one -on -one clinical hours with a kid, um, teaching them each sound and its phonetic features and a special name for it before we ever started putting those together. So it's, it's no wonder many of the students struggled to learn those and had to be constantly rewarded with candy or, or bribes from parents to even keep coming. Now, the next issue we have is that, all right, once you've learned all the sounds that each letter makes, you need to look then at how you explain the combining of letters that happens. There, these rules are needed to explain the strange behavior of the letters. So why, for example, the letter I doesn't have a sound in words like rain. The explanation given in phonics is that, well, when you have two vowels walking, Excuse me, I'm trying to make a little change over here so I can see better. There we go. The, when you have two vowels walking together, the, written together, it's the first one that is sounded. And if you think about that rule, it's, it's in a propositional log logic. It's an if-then statement. And young kids actually can't manage that, not until after age nine at best. Yes, there are exceptional children, and, and there's the fact that with enough time and enough effort, you can force rote memorization of, the, of those rules. But this is precisely what we call, everybody calls developmentally inappropriate instruction. It takes so long and it's so hard because you're, you're battling a developmental stumbling block. And even for those of us who, who can understand the rule and apply it, it, the logic of the rules can be difficult to follow and they're frequently wrong. The, the two vowel go walking rule, for example, holds true only 40% of the time. When 40% of the time you encounter two vowel letters next to each other. So I recall my, fir my first adult student, non-reader student, and he said, this is what threw him off the most in life. At school, they would present a rule, and all he could think of were the exceptions to it. He couldn't understand the rule because nothing that should fit it did fit it. He, he thought he was just too dumb and couldn't get it. And that perception of himself continued until he and I learned another way to look at things. Now, in in the blue back speller, the next thing they would do is memorize all the exceptions to the rules once they memorize the rules. So let's think about that for a second. If a rule holds true only 40% of the time, then we have to deal with the exceptions. 
60% of the time, a two vowel rule follower encounters an exception. So the next step in the phonics approach was to memorize all of those. And that's a whole lot of word, whole word memorization. Precisely what learning the sounds and the rules was supposed, was supposed to help us prevent. So again, reflecting on my own experience, I recall so much instructional time spent on memorizing sight words. We had all our, our, our sound work and then we'd pull out our word cards and work on memorizing, memorizing word after word after word of the sight words. And some kids were pretty good at it, but for others, it was a nightmare. They would struggle and struggle to learn those words. And even when they did, when I tested their reading, many still wouldn't recognize them in the books and they wouldn't hold on to them. They'd lose them and we'd have to start all over on the list. So that's how phonics got started. And it was used for a very long time. It kept evolving over time with more rules and more memorization tactics for the rules and even more exceptions or ways to rules for the exceptions. Um, and it culminated in the 1970s with an illiteracy rate of about 30%. And whether you think the number is accurate in the book, too high or too low, I think we can all agree that, that no matter what, there were too many kids failing to read with enough proficiency to choose any life, path in life that they might want. And that's not okay for me. <laughs> um, so thinking about this phonics approach, the there's a basic premise there. The written English is so confusing that it needs rules, regulations, and contingencies in order to be learned. And I think this sentiment is still shared by most people, even folks here. But I think it never occurred to the phonics innovators that maybe it is the rules that are confusing rather than the written code itself. Well, it certainly never occurred to me before I read this book. Um, I knew the rules were confusing, but I thought they were needed. And I spent 10 years working to help kids learn them to get over the confusions. And also wondering why they might learn the rules but never remembered to apply them when I tested their reading after memorizing them. So then we turn to whole language. At its most basic, the theory is that children don't need to learn the code to read. It's too unpredictable to be learned. And we can just recognize an unlimited number of whole words in the same way that we recognize familiar objects in our visual world. We recognize lots of objects and the names for them, thousands and thousands and thousands. So why not just do it with the whole words as well? Literature then is used to excite the children to begin memorizing all the words they're seeing in the books. Invented spelling is allowed and encouraged as children were expected to sort of emerge into literacy. And teachers were encouraged to be inventive for the very first time, really, in mandatory instruction or education. They were encouraged to create language-rich environments, and teachers actually loved it, this creativity and this, this, this power they had in it. And they became real leaders of whole language innovation. The problem, though, of course, is that recognizing words is not like other stimuli and it just doesn't work. There's a really nice illustration of this on page eight. So I encourage you to look back at that if you, if you don't see right away why whole words are different. And, you know, teachers seem to know that the code needed to be taught because from the beginning, whole language was being mixed in the classrooms with phonics instruction. It never really left the classrooms. Um, but at this point, we were doing even worse than before. In 1995, the illiteracy rate was 43%. So the proposed solution was, well, let's mix them together then. 
into a balanced literacy approach, which is a big movement on its own now. Um, I recall in the, in the late 1990s, after I found the Reading Reflex book and was trained and became a, a, a licensed trainer for the um, authors, students at a local teacher college begged me to teach phonographics through the school. They were desperate to learn how to teach someone to read, the mechanics of it. Uh, the university administrators, though, wouldn't allow it because they wanted me to teach a balanced literacy approach. Interesting. So what's going on now? Well, if we look at the present state, or at least the present state at the time the book was written, <laughs> um, from a 20 year mountain of research, we now know the three strongest determinants of future reading success. And this includes reading comprehension. So the three large strongest determinants of future reading comprehension, right? Are phonemic awareness, which is separating and blending sounds and words, alphabetic code knowledge, which is the correspondence between the sounds and the symbols, and an early start around five years. So I know Reading Reflex was written in the 1990s, so we, we may know more now to refine this list, but I would say it hasn't changed that radically, and this is a really good starting point for us. And the complaints about phonographics that we talked, I mean, phon phonics, sorry, that we talked about just a bit ago, um, still hold, and now we can add a bit more precision to it. Well, for phonemic awareness, phonics often doesn't teach it, or if it does, the data shows it's still not teaching it well. And you can look at Kilpatrick's book, for example, for a great discussion of that. About the alphabetic code, well, phonics teaches only about 50% of the alphabet code, you know, focusing upon the, the sounds that each single letter make. And then, Thinking about the early start, phonics teaches that alphabetic knowledge then, from then, using logically inappropriate methods for kids under nine. So mixing phonics with whole language isn't going to solve our problem. Right? But you know, they both have things that are sort of right about them. Whole language is right on that we should be reading great literature as soon as kids are, possible, are able, right? Integrated curriculum is great, as is making books meaningful across the curriculum. Those parts are right. And phonics is right in recognizing the importance of teaching phonetics, which is describing the various sounds of a given language. But that's about all phonics is correct about. From that point on, it, it's confusing, often wrong, and developmentally inappropriate to young children. So on page 11 of Reading Reflex, you'll find a great discussion of why we need to start quite differently. We need to, a sound to print approach to teach the code of our written language. It's a there's a really good discussion there on page 11. For those of you who are new to this idea of sound to print, or for those of you who, who need to explain it to someone, I think it's explained very well and easy to digest no matter what your background is. But in there, you know, you'll see that they talk about how phonics is wrong from the very beginning. It begins teaching the sounds for all the letters. The, a letter to sound orientation is just wrong. The sounds existed before writing. Symbols were invented to represent the sounds. The symbols are the invented thing that needs to be taught. When you start from letters, you're failing to allow the child to use what they already possess, the sounds. Now, linguists like myself will argue about almost anything, what the definition of the word is, is for example but they won't argue with the fact that language is innate, it's hardwired, 
already before the kids ever get to a point where they're ready to start to read. Even your ESL students, they have a language with sounds. They're not acquiring all that new. Uh, they're just acquiring the settings of a, new, of a new language. So what we need to do is show the child how to tap into that knowledge, right? which is like a magic key to the written code. Phonics treats the sounds as if they are the new thing and something new that needs to get taught. And it's confusing to the child. And it's especially frustrating to older students I find who recognize that they know the sounds already. And then when you're starting from letters, it, problems <laughs> just keep going because the remainder of the code, the, the double letters that represent sounds, have to be taught using developmentally inappropriate activities and tedious and inaccurate rules and rules that developmental psychologists have long known kids under nine can't manage. And when I read this in the Reading Reflex book for the first time, man, did things click. I started thinking about the scientific method, right? In the scientific method, you make a theory and then you test it. So in a way, phonics rules are a theory. They're an explanation of how letters behave, right? So what happens in the scientific method when you test your theory and you find exceptions to it, things that don't work? What does that tell you about your theory? Well, it tells you it's wrong, right? So if we apply that to the phonics rules, then we know the rules are, are wrong. They need to be adjusted. The theory needs to be adjusted, right? So the adjustment, well, what's apparent to do? Well, we know what we need to avoid now, right? And we know what we need to accomplish. So let's focus on here on out on that. So what's apparent to do? Well, this method, phonographics and the method described for, for parents to use in reading reflex is researched and proven to work on children age four to adult non-readers. It takes what the child knows, the sounds of his language, and what it teaches are the various sound pictures that represent those sounds. And it does, it does it through developmentally appropriate lessons that don't rely on propositional and other logic that children can't understand. So on page 12, after this, you'll find a presentation of some of the findings and what we can accomplish when we make this shift from phonics to a phonetic linguistic approach. I'm not going to go through all the, all the findings and the studies that prove that it works. I'm not here to sell you phonographics. I'm here to show you how to do it. So, so in order for us to do it, we need to understand reading theoretically because we need to teach it. And to teach anything well, you need to understand the processes and the subskills involved. The funny thing is reading is second nature to you. So the subskills and the knowledge of the code that you use as you do it are mostly unconscious when you're doing it. So one of the main goals of, or the main goals of this book are to teach the subskills and to give you ways to help your child practice them and to tell you what the code is and show you how to teach it to your child too. And from page 14 to 16, you'll find a discussion of the subskills necessary to reading and teaching them in a manner that's a, that a young child can understand. I'm just going to go through these quickly because we're going to run out of time if we go through everything. But you'll want to take some time on this section. It, it takes each one and explains it really well, I think. So first subskill is being able to scan text from left to right. And young children can do this. They don't all remember to do it. Some of them need to practice doing it. Uh, but it's something that it's an ability they, they can do. Um, the next is the ability to match visual symbols to auditory sounds, such as the, 
the symbol, the letter T, equaling the sound. Young children can do this paired associate learning as long as the relevance is added to the formula. So we teach only eight sound pictures at a time and teach them by using them to read and to spell. By using them, children begin to understand why they need to know them, the relevance of the information. So that's one of the keys to making it work. The next subskill is to blend discrete sound units into words. Young children can do this once they're shown by example what is expected of them. And so, of course, we're going to learn how to do that and how to teach a kid to do it. And I want to point out that we're going to start teaching this in our very first lesson with your child. The next ability is being able to segment sounds and words. Again, young children can do this once they're shown by example how and what's expected of them. And again, we're going to start this in our very first lesson. They also need the ability to understand that sometimes two or more letters represent a sound. For example, the letters SH represent a single sound, shh. Very young children can't understand this by imposing a propositional rule. But they can easily understand that sometimes it just happens. Uh, they can understand that this is a square, this is a triangle, but this is a house. It's not a hard thing for young kids to, to understand. It's amazing they do. Um, children can understand in the same way that symbols, the symbols known as S and H, can be used together and called something else entirely. Shh. I love this analogy and I often use it to explain what we're doing to parents and to students who are mature enough when we turn to this. The next sub skill is being able to understand that most sounds can be represented in more than one way. I would say actually all sounds can be represented in more than one way. It happens with all the vowels, it happens with all the consonants. And we'll see a, a chart of these later. I loved seeing the chart for the first time too. But just an example, the sound E looks different in the word eat and different from the word tree and different from the word happy. But young children can understand this and begin to learn it. And they begin to show consistent memorized recall of the various ways to represent different sounds at about age seven to eight. And the analogy given in the book on page 16 is, is so useful in seeing how children can do this and for explaining this to others. Children are perfectly okay with the fact that all these flowers look different. And they are perfectly okay with the fact that the symbols for the sound E can look different too. The final subskill is being able to understand that some of the concepts in the code, I mean, the components of the code can represent more than one sound. For example, the symbol that we have named the letter O can be used to represent the sounds A ah in hot or O oh in most. So can children understand that? Well, they can. They have no trouble understanding that a single symbol can represent two different things. So we know they can understand that the sound picture O oh, can represent two different things too. A ah, in hot, O oh, in most. So these are the subskills for reading that new readers must learn. Um, we went through those very quickly, but the book takes you through them in detail with, with some great examples and explanations. So I, I encourage you to look closely at that section. And what follows next in the book is a fascinating illustration of these subskills in action, of what we're doing as we read, but are doing so fluently and proficiently that we aren't even aware that we're doing it. So my first assignment for you is for you to go back and do a close read of, of page 16, the last paragraph through page 19. Going through that example 
um, deserves a bit of time and quiet reflection and it's not easily done in a group. And so I'll leave that for you to experience on your own and we can discuss it next time if you like. Okay. And I'll, I'll put this assignment up again too later, but just make a note that you wanna go through that. Yeah. Now, what about all the words that we seem to recognize immediately by sight? At this point, I think we all start to wonder about all the thousands of words that we, we recognize instantly, right? I love how this expla is explained on page 19, uh, that yeah, we, we, we build up a visual inventory, but if we were taught properly, we know the code, even if we don't know it you know, explicitly and consciously, and are able to decode when we encounter new or different words or unusual names, et cetera. And when we fail to teach the code and the subskills, children begin to think that memorizing words as pictures is what they're supposed to do. Even if we aren't in a whole language approach, they still begin to think that. It, it becomes their strategy, what we'll call reading globally. And they fall in it, into it so easily. You know, some kids are great memorizers and the books they encounter in those first years have such a limited range of words that they're easily memorized. And we as parents and teachers even inadvertently drive them toward this with comments like, you know that word, come on, what is it? Which is telling the child that he needs to remember whole words. And if you add in using picture clues, and cues and guessing, and this strategy can actually get them pretty far. The problem is they don't know what's coming. We use 20,000 or more words in our daily vocabulary, and a typical person can memorize only about two to 3,000. That'll get a global reader, you know, through the early primary grades, and that's about it. Even the best memorizers can only memorize about 5,000 words. That's not enough to get beyond the primary grades. But the global strategy is just so pervasive. So what's the alternative? Well, we need to teach the code. And there are about 134 sound pictures that represent the various sounds of English. Those are the most common ones. Oh, and with those, we can use and spell almost any word. There are about 55 words that don't don't decode properly with that set of sound pictures. A word like yacht is one of them, for example. So the other 19,950 words are quite predictable and decodable if you know the entire code. And that's crucial, the entire code. When you teach just the single letter sound pictures, you then need to go on to teach the advanced code, the sound pictures that are more than one letter. In phonics, kids learn the sounds of every letter and then they launch into rules, right? In phonographics, we'll just keep teaching, teaching the sound pictures that are more than one letter. And without this knowledge, students will begin to attack words one letter at a time and by fourth grade, about year five over in the UK, about 60% of the text that they're encountering is advanced code level text. So they're gonna be unsuccessful at sounding out and they're gonna give on, up on that entirely. The good news is this book lays out to the parent exactly how to teach it step-by-step. Step. So that's the first chapter, Reading Explained. It's all worth reading again. I'm coming back to later again at some point. Um, I seem to get down to another layer of the onion every time I read this chapter. So with that, let's turn to how we're gonna do this, right? How we're gonna teach this. Um, wanna point out that reading reflex is intended for younger kids, right? Or primary age kids. Young kids age five or so who are ready to read, you're gonna use this book over the next several years. Right. And for remediation, you want to work as quickly as you can through all the lesson plans. 
Now you can use the book with even younger students. And as we do our book study, we can talk with anybody who wants to do that. Um, and remember that phonographics method is used, of course, with older students. And if you're working with an older student, let's be sure to talk about adapting the lessons and presentations and the supplemental phonographics materials that I would suggest you move um, on to do. Okay. Next in the book is a note to teachers and tutors. Most of the contact information in there is out of date. The book was written in the 1990s after all. Um, here's some more current contact information. You'll get everything from the website, so that's where you probably wanna go. And you'll find the support materials they talk about there at the website. And certification training is now offered online or by licensed trainers. And you'll find information about that at the website. And of course, we can talk about it later as we go too. Okay, phew, that was an action packed info packed chapter. And I know that we all just want to start the lessons, but understanding all of that is important to your success. So let's get that nailed down. We'll have discussion times and we'll have a lot less lecture to go through in the next sections, I think. But we are supposed to cover this chapter too, which is about getting started. So in here, you, there's a lot of information. It's a lot easier to read. So I might leave you to read a lot of it yourself, but it presents what you'll need to get started, some suggestions for setting up your workspace, information about how children process information and their motivations and, um, and the subtests, I mean, the pretests, the, the tests to help you determine which of the sub skills your child needs to work with. The, the remaining chapters after this one are the actual instruction. So we're going to start on that next session. But let's get ready for the instruction first. I suggest you read the entire chapter, of course. It's structured around common parental concerns. Um, I'm just going to run through the section headings right now because we're running out of time and I want to spend time showing you how to do the test. And you can go back and read the ones that are really relevant for you and your child again and again. Or teachers, if you're using this um, study, you can see where parents often get hung up and help parents work better in partnership with you on your instruction. So, ah, and I see that my, my sample student has just arrived, the one that we're going to go through the tests with. So let me, let me just say, um, or point out again that this chapter goes through a lot of parental concerns and then has a nice discussion for each one. Um, next time, what we can do is maybe go through some of them if you have questions, because um, I did sort of summarize a lot of them, right? Uh, but I want to just point out some highlights. One thing that's important is that we get a consistent spot to work that's quiet and away from other family members and away from where your child does homework and away from their home, their room. Um, so you're going to need to prepare your space. You need a, a table to work with where you can sit across from each other and reach. And there are a lot of reasons why we want that. And you can read that in this chapter. You're going to need comfortable upright chairs and no glare and good angles for reading, for example. And there's a shopping list on page 30. So you want to look at that and make sure you gather those things for, for next time. And that's an assignment I have for you is to set up your space and to gather your materials. Okay. Um, and when you do that, it'll, it'll help you hugely to maintain control of the lesson. And keep in mind that you are the one who's, who's controlling the lesson, the environment and the materials. And when you, as you read this chapter, some of it may seem persnickety to you. Uh, but I remember when I was working with one of my most challenging students, he was um, Asperger's, came with a lot of labels, Asperger's, ADHD, bipolar, dyslexic, dysgraphic. He had extremely high IQ and I'm sure I'm missing something. But um, anyway, we, we ended up working well together because I did this and in the end, you know, he said to me that he, 
he was amazing in his observations. He said, you should never underestimate the, the psychological effect of the setup of your clinic. So I think it's important, uh, the, all the things that you'll read there. Uh, so there are some more, more issues here that you can read about. And I think we'll stop, we'll look at this one. How much and how often? So keep in mind that when we get to the lessons, the more you do, the faster your child will learn. So for young students, um, you want a minimum of 90 minutes a week. For older, a, a minimum of two hours a week. And you can certainly split that up. You can figure out a schedule that works for you. Um, and they have some good suggestions here in this section for you for, for that scheduling and some cautions. Avoid late nights and busy times of day, like right before dinner. Inconsistent schedules and at all costs, avoid long periods of time without lessons. Okay. So, and there's talk of pacing. There's um, things that you can expect, general goals for literacy development. Um, you'll find a literacy growth chart on page 44. And I wanted to point out that there's an updated version of that one up at the website. So I, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I send you guys the link or something for that um, before the next session. And some suggestions that you trust yourself. You, uh, you know your child better than anybody else. So you have some information you can use to your advantage. So. But I wanted to get to this while I have my sample student. Uh, your assignment for next time is to, of course, set up your space and then give the pretest to your child. So we're going to turn to the, that now as we finish up this chapter. And don't be nervous about giving the test. We're going to go through the tests together right now, and I'll demonstrate them all with a student. And, but let's think about the test just for a second. For children who are in the sixth month of first grade, which is year two in the UK, I believe, or older, it's important to know what their problems are. So give all the tests. For younger children, you give all but the auditory processing test because that test isn't developmentally appropriate, the test itself, not, not what we ask kids to do. Um, and with the younger kids, you wanna give lots of direction and examples so they understand what you want them to do. And stop a test when you reach a point of failure. You know, if there are three consecutive incorrect responses, there's no reason to keep going. The, the fourth of the tests that we're gonna give is the code knowledge test. And this may challenge you too. If you have trouble accessing the sounds from the example words, well then contact me. You can do that through the phonographics website if you need to, okay? But I do wanna point out, we don't have that, the auditory tape that they had back in the 1990s. It was a cassette tape that they sent out. Um, so that's why I suggest that you contact me. We'll figure out something. The composite score sheet that we're gonna look at at the very end, I want you to keep in mind, it's just an overall idea of where your child stands. 89 or below on that um, doesn't mean we're going to recommend a retention or anything like that at all. It just means you should get through the lessons and provide your child with what's needed fast. And I want to point out that 90 or above doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing to teach. Those skills may not be being integrated in order to read. Uh, so that would be something to keep in mind as you look at those scores. But mostly I think you wanna just use the results to forewarn you of chapters that you're gonna to need to work extra hard with. But that doesn't mean you skip anything that looks easy. Go ahead and do all those chapters anyway, okay? All right, so you will find the pretest pages on page 45 to 50, okay? And you are going to need to either write in your book or photocopy the pages. And if you really don't wanna do that, 
the store at the phonographics website has a downloadable PDF of all the pages that you'll need to write on or to cut up. So let me show you how to find that, okay? You go to the website, you go to the store, and in the instructional materials, you can pick by age or you can just go to instructional materials. You'll find that right here, okay? So that might be useful for you if you don't like to destroy your books or make photocopies. And then while you're there, you just might consider one of the home instruction starter kits. Each of the starter kits comes with that PDF. It comes with a whiteboard and eraser and pens and the sound charts that we're gonna see later, appropriate readers and um, support workbooks that go alongside the lessons in the book, in the Reading Reflex book that you can use for review and practice and such. You can purchase a kit with, it, with or without Reading Reflex. So if you already have it, that's fine. Um, and there is a coupon code that I'm giving to your group so that they can get 15% off um, on any of those kits. Okay, just things that might be helpful for you. Oops, but right now it's time to shift to looking at those tests and how you're gonna do them. So let me stop sharing now. And I'm going to move us over. Oops, I don't know what happened. Oh yeah, I had to do that. I'm gonna move this over to where my student is. <laughs> and move a couple of things so we can see. Let's see, is that gonna work? And all right, so this is my daughter, Samantha. And she has very kindly agreed to be a little student for me so you could see what, what, how things look in action. But I don't think you need to see us. What you're gonna to need to see are the actual, um, materials and things. So let me shift to, okay, you can see my screen, that's great. But what I need to do is change my video, right? And we shouldn't be seeing this, we should be seeing, oh, I don't wanna share, I don't wanna share my screen. What I wanna do is just be on the video, there we go. So these are the sheets that we use for the test. I'm hoping, it shows up. Yep. There you go. It's yep. clear now. It's good. Okay, perfect. Good. And this, this test is mostly done orally. So the student wouldn't be seeing this sheet. I'm going to leave it here so I can record and you can sort of see the recordings. But keep in mind, Samantha is not supposed to be seeing anything as we do this yet. And the first test, you just give the tests in the order in the book. So blending is the first one and there are directions at the top of each of the tests so you can read those carefully but so you don't need to make a ton of notes about how to do it i just want you to experience it see what i do okay um and you would make sure the student can't see what you're writing because you don't want them to see if they're right or wrong so samantha yes we're going to play some games with sounds Yay. I just want to see what you know and what you don't know. You don't have to act like a, a like a little kid okay. or anything. You can just be yourself. Right. It's fine. <laughs> and don't worry if you make mistakes. That should, just would mean that, that that tells us things that we could work on, right? Okay. I know you haven't worked with sounds and things in years, probably. Yeah. You've been reading for a while. So it'd be good to just go back and see what you've been taught and what you haven't. Okay. So we're going to start with a little game where I'm going to say some sounds, and I want you to tell me what word I'm saying. Okay. And I, I do need you to listen very carefully and watch carefully because I only get to say each word once, okay? If you're not sure, it's okay, just take a guess. So let me give you an example of what we're gonna do. If I say s, i, t, sit, what word is that? Sit. Great, all right, you understand? Yeah. All right, so let's get going. Here's the first one. P, 
e g pig b a g bug at hat p i n pin r at rat b r d bird sh a o shell f i v five b o t boat f r a g frog g r a s grass so I, th I think you see that my student probably doesn't need a lot of help with this. I would imagine she'd do fine if I continued. Samantha, can you make a couple of mistakes so people could see what I would do? Okay, yes. Okay. Stick. Stick. Print. Print. And the last one. So you can see I simply write down the incorrect responses and um, so that I can look back later. And I, I try hard to keep a poker face, not let her know <laughs> whether she got them right or wrong. And then you just add up the two columns and, you, and you'll get your score. So uh, next time what I'll do is I'll share a copy of the completed one and we can talk about it. But right now I just want you to know how to get it and then we can think about what it means. Does that sound like a good plan? So that was segmenting. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that was blending. So the next one is phoning segmentation test. And I like to do that one right after the blending because then I can say, Okay, Samantha, I gave you the sounds, right? Um, this time, I'll give you the words and you give me the sounds. So, for example, what are the sounds you hear in sit? It. Great. All right. You know how to do it. Sounds good. What are the sounds you hear in dog? D -a -g. And I, of course, if it was a younger child, I could ask for each sound. I could say, what's the first sound? What's the next sound if I need to? And that's in the directions. Um, what are the sounds you hear in hat? At. Pin. I. Pot. P -ot. Rat. Er. At. Nut. Nut. <laughs> Uh, that one was a little hard to hear. I wasn't quite sure. She's going a little fast. So with Sorry. a student like that, I might encourage them to just slow down, tell them I have to write everything okay. down, I'll right? Slow down. <laughs> um, frog. Er, ah, Black. B, l, a, k. Nest. N, e, s, t. And knowing Samantha, I doubt she's going to make any mistakes really on here. Um, so... Sam, can you make a few mistakes so that okay, yeah, so sure. that they could see the scoring? Okay. Trip. T er ipe. Hand. Ad. Drum. D er m. Okay. So the mistake she made was she said the incorrect sound. So I just wrote that down. So on that word, she's only going to get three points for the other three sounds. And the other mistake she made was leaving sounds out. So I left the, 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 the place empty where that goes. Okay. And then we would add that up for her score. So we can talk about that next time too. The next test is the auditory processing test, it's called. And I, here's how I give it. So in this one, I'm going to give you a word. I want you to repeat it. So okay. we know we have the right word. Okay. And then I'll ask you to say the word with one of the sounds taken away. Okay. So you can see why this test would not be appropriate for a very young child. It's hard for them to understand it, what, they, what you want of them. So that's why we skip it with a very young student. Okay, so here's the first one. Say PIM. PIM. Now say PIM without the P. M. Say TOG. TOG. Now say tog without the g. 
Ta. Say sip. Sip. Now say sip without the s. Ip. Say stop. Stop. Now say stop without the s. Ought. Say nest. Nest. Now say nest without the t. Nest. Say flag. Flag. Now say flag without the f. Flag. Say plum. Plum. Now say plum without the u. Um. <laughs> say best. Best. Now say best without the s. <laughs> say grill. Grill. Now say grill without the r. Gill. Say lost. Lost. Now lost without the s. Lot. Great. All right. And we can just, I wrote down what she said. And we can look at the scoring next time too. But the next test we do, and this is the last one, is the code knowledge test. So there's a cue card that she'll be looking at, okay? That's this, that has the sound pictures that I'll be pointing to and asking about. So she sees that. And then you have a recording sheet where you record the answers, okay? I'm gonna pull this up here, Sam, so that they can just see a little bit at the beginning, see what I'm doing, because I'm gonna be pointing to them. So if you saw this in a word, I'm gonna make it so you can see better. Okay, if you saw this in a word, mm -hmm. what sound would you say for it? B. Great. What sound would you say for that? Good, keep going. D. J. J. K. I. N. N. P. R. S. T. Mm. Now I'm with this so they can maybe see a little more of what I'm writing, perhaps. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're not sure, it's okay to take a guess. You. Okay. Good. Keep going. Mm. I. Now that oh. one can be I. Do you know another sound it can be? I don't know. Okay. If you don't know, that's fine. How about the next one? Eh. That's the kind. Let's do that kind, yeah. Eh. Ah. Uh. Ooh. Good. Now, how about over here? What sound would you say for that? Shh. Um, Q? And that's the last one. How about up here? What sound would, if you saw that in a book, what, what sound, or on a word, what sound would you say for it? A. Oh. Yeah, these are tough. You know, we're not used to looking at these by themselves. Just do the best you can. What do you think you might say for that? A. Great. Good. Keep going. A. O. I. E. A. A. 
Y I I O E E E E E O E Oi. Oh. And great. Thank you, Samantha. Great. So we'll look at this later. You know, I'll score it and, and talk about it. Okay. With you. And um, that's that's the test. You can see students can be really quick. <laughs> it can be difficult to hear. So if you need to, you might record it and then you could look back and, and listen to it, go back to listen to it to get a few if you were unsure. It's fine to ask the child to slow down and point, you know, point to each one and say, I really, I need to hear it. I need to write it. So give me the time for that. And that's perfectly fine to do. Samantha, thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. And um, I need to finish up with class. So you can go on back and thank you, thank you. And I uh, will definitely need you next time for de demonstrating lessons, okay? Right, so let me change the video here. Back to normal. Okay. So let me grab my sheets. And as I said, I'll share with you the sheet so you can see. And we can talk about what, what happened there and what I would recommend. And this was fascinating to give to my daughter and see what she knows and what she hasn't been using, obviously. There's some missing code knowledge that we could work with. Now, I don't expect students to get 100% on that code knowledge test. We're not looking for that, but we're looking for enough to work with. So I'm gonna have to sit down and actually score this up and see what her numbers are. But I really want a student to feel like they know enough of the code to be above 80% on that one. So I'll see what her score is and we can talk about that. Uh, but that, oh gosh aid into the time I'd hoped for our discussion. I'm happy to stay and as long as people want to discuss things. I don't have to run off, but I know we promised that it would be about 75 minutes, didn't we, Donna? Right. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, go ahead. So I was, I wrote that in the chat, your daughter appeared to be struggling a little bit and not, and I think she was visualizing the word. Mm-hmm. Yep, and then trying to translate to sounds and things. Yes. It wasn't automatic for her at all. No. And I know she was taught with phonographics when she was in kindergarten, right? Taught to read. But she's been in the school system since then. And, and she's, she's a bit of a pistol. She doesn't want to really learn much. She's stubborn. She doesn't want to learn much from me. So it, it's actually going to be really cool to have her as you know, yeah. my student that you can watch as we do, do the lessons. Yeah. Especially for an older one, we always focus on the younger ones, but this is, is she middle school? No, not quite. She's fifth grade. So oh, she's okay. 11. Well, she looked older. She does. She's, she's very tall. <laughs> so, okay. But that's good. Oh, you, know, that's, you know, that's good to have an older student. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions for Aaron? Anything? I Okay, great. Um, I'm wondering how this works with students who have already been through a pretty robust Orton-Gillingham program. Mm -hmm. Well, what you'll want to do is start with the tests and see if there's holes there, right? And I think you may find that the, what I found, that the advanced code, the, the things that are more than one letter, right, is, is still a bit baffling to them and, take, and slows them down. Right. And you may find some missing skills, you know, like the the phony manipulation skill the, that we did. I'm sorry, in in the more current materials, it's called phony manipulation uh, test. But in in reading reflex, it's called auditory processing. Samantha was not automatic with that auditory processing. You know, she made some mistakes and she was slow with some of it. So I can see she needs, you know, some work in that area that would help her help her fluency, help her accuracy. 
So, mm -hmm. so that's what I would suggest with your um, Orton Gillingham students. And I know that when I first got trained in phonographics, I had been working with a very intense reading program um, that covered all this material, but covered it in, in a more phonics way, I think. And when I came back from that training, I started working with my students and made the shift and, and it, I think you'll find it's going to be quite easy to, to make the shift with them. Um, you can just explain, you've seen another way to look at things and work with them and let's see how it works. Mm -hmm. I think the hardest part is for someone who's been trained in Orton Gillingham to use phonographics because it's a whole different way to look at things. Yes. And so you're going to have to unlearn quite a bit mm -hmm. and be willing to do the lessons as they're described, not as you have always done them, right? Because <laughs> they will be the same activities. You're going to be doing word building, which I'm sure you do in OG, right? But the way you do it is going to be different. And you're going to have to really look at those steps and see if you're really following those steps or the OG steps, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations for uh, a young child? Well, he just turned seven. Mm -hmm. He cannot remember the names of the letters. So I switched to this hoping that we could get started, you know, get, build some foundation. What recommendations do you have for him? Well, you know, if you think back to our discussion or, you know, my presentation of mm -hmm. phonics and where it goes wrong, you know, kids have, some kids have real trouble with those paired associates, right? Right. And it is because in phonics, we, there's not much meaning, you know, to a, a letter, a, a symbol, right? And it's sound, the you know, the connection there and, and, in phonics, we spend a lot of time just trying to memorize them, but what helps kids to learn those associates is meaning, right? Some meaningful interaction with it. Like learning language, when he finally learns to say drink, he's going to get a drink, right? There is a reward to that connection. So we want to make sure there's a reward, you know, something meaningful to the connection between the sound and the symbol that we're going to show him. So when you start the lessons here, you're going to see a different way and you may find that he actually can learn the letters and the sounds, right? Okay. But we're going to be really careful that the only thing we do is have him learn two things. Okay. The symbol and the sound it is. So we're not going to learn the names of the letters the or other things right. that can make it hard. He doesn't need them to read anyway. So Right, right. Okay. Here's another question. At some point, do you go from sound to symbol to symbol to sound as in Spalding? Spalding makes those very automatic so you can flex them. Mm. So do you mean we, do we like read words going sound to symbol and then also um, symbol uh, spell sound. words <laughs> by taking is that what you mean? Going between decoding and encoding? Is, is, the, is the poster still here? That was okay. my question. Mm -hmm. And in Spalding, you would say like uh, AW is the AW uh, that you can use at the end of a word. AU is the AW uh, that you can't use at the end of the word. So you know those AWs and OIs automatically. Yeah, we're going to be doing a lot of work with them, but we're going to just do it a different way. And we're going to have kids drawing those patterns about where the particular ways to do AW uh, appear. So they're going to be telling you that they notice that when aw is at the end of a word, it tends to be o a w, right? And that's part of the lessons that we'll have. You'll see that at um, chapter five, which is the advanced code. So it'll be it'll be fascinating, I think, for you to see it just a different way to present it and work with it. But we will be covering all that. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Comments? Actually, I have a question. Um, I'm unlearning myself. So what is the best way so that I can make sure that I'm pronouncing it right? Yeah, yeah, that's hard at first. <laughs> uh, definitely. Um, that's why I said, if anybody's really worried about that, you know, contact me and maybe we can spend just a little bit of time together 
and I can I can guide you. But the good thing is through a lot of the materials, there'll be sample words. So you can read the sample and really listen to the sound that you hear in there and practice pulling that sound out like the kids will need to do. And we're gonna start out with the students pretty, pretty simple. We're gonna start out with just eight sound pictures to begin with. So you can learn the sounds and the sound pictures with the student as we go. You know, I'm going to be showing you the lessons and we'll, we'll learn the sounds each time. So it's really just, I think for the test that might be hard at the very beginning for you. Uh, what age of student are you going to be working with? Five and eight. Five and eight? Yeah. So, so for the five-year-old, five yeah. So for the five-year-old, you could almost skip the, the pretest, right? Yes. And for the eight-year-old, do you know what the issues are already? <laughs> do you know what's hard? Um, I just think that he doesn't really like to read in general. <laughs> oh, so you just got to figure it out. So if you really, really struggle with that code knowledge test and being able to give it and um, you're really nervous about it, for the first students, you could try just not doing the te that test. And then when you get more confident and comfortable as we're working with sounds and sound pictures, then you could go back and give that test and see how he's doing. Does that sound like a good plan? Yes. Because um, I just started working on them maybe like a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, this session came. So I'm like, okay, great. Let me get into this. Yeah, but, good. good. Um, what's the best way to contact you as well? At the website, the phonographics website, there's a contact page and, and that comes right to me. So you could, you can send me emails through there. Or my email address is, is contact at phonographics.com. So phono is P-H-O-N-O, -O, and there's a hyphen, and then G-R-A-P-H-I-X dot com. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I should put that in the chat, shouldn't yep. I? Um, I forget that you can do such things. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. I have a question for the group. Sure. Great, so is great. this what you guys are wanting from the book study, where we kind of look at the chapter, the highlights, go through as much as we can, but I focus on demonstrating what you need to do? Can you put yeah. your answers in the chat, please? Yeah, because I'm happy to adjust. I haven't written the next our next pre meeting because I wanted to see how this went and what people are really wanting. So if you want a focus on something more or less, just let me know and I'll, I can take that into consideration. Or if you expected something else. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I had one gal that hopped off and she said, oh, next time we should go into small groups and just discuss what we read. Mm -hmm. And I am a little hesitant to do that because then I think you might as well just read the book yourself. I, I wanted this to be a, a, a you know, an author led book study. Mm -hmm. So but we could always try to add small group discussions after. It's, right? true. Mm -hmm. it's true. Like after we've been through some material, if, yep. if people really want that. Yep, the visual is great. I agree. I mean, that's how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, and I'm excited that Samantha has things for, to work on so you can see it, you know, <laughs> rather than her just pretending to be a kid, a little Won't kid. Won't she something. be surprised? <laughs> <laughs> well, she knows spelling is hard. It's been oh. it's been something. So, so it's I think it'll be, oh. it'll be good. Does her school district teach spelling? Not in a, a systematic way at all. Mm -hmm. the, her kindergarten teacher was actually using phonographics because I was volunteering in the classroom, mm -hmm. and uh, her teacher. I said you know, her teacher knew what I do. And she's, and I said, you could give me struggling students if you want, and I can help out, and, you know, pull them in the back and work with them or something. And so her teacher asked me to do that. And then she started watching what I was doing. And she, she said, I thought I was doing phonographics, but I'm not. Um, oh, and okay. so she did it. She really worked with me and watched and learned and trained and, and she did a wonderful job in kindergarten, but it, it kind of fell by the wayside as, as things went further along in the, as Sam went up through the, the different grades. And 
you know, they really didn't have anything they were using for spelling. Sure. They, they found they had some spelling lists that they threw at the kids, but there wasn't anything teaching them how to spell. Yeah. And, th and that's the thing. I think districts don't even realize how sound based spelling is, how important mm -hmm. it is. And they, and they just, think it's memorization based still. It's just, yeah, or rules based or, you know, whatever, but um, it really is sound based. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? Because otherwise we'll call it quits for the night. Yeah, will we still see these um, chat things later or should I try to look at them now before I, I will save the chat. There okay. was not really a whole lot in there, but you can, okay. I can send it to you. Okay, we've got one new message. Oh, thank you. And I want to thank everyone for your time. Uh, plan on 75 minutes to um, 90, I guess that would be. Yeah, maybe. So, uh, like hour, hour and a half. With I have discussion. a hard time not being you know, verbose. <laughs> six plus 15 is 75. <laughs> okay. All right, folks. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Oh, oh, I didn't show you what your homework was again. Oh, remember. So let's just review that real fast. So I had a certain page I wanted to pages 16 to 19 to read again, right? And I wanted you to read the section about setting up your space and the materials you'll need and, and do that. And I wanted you to try to get the test if you can. Great. Right? So find a student to work with and um, mm -hmm. that'll make this much more applicable and um yeah you're really going to learn it if you do it if so you do it. Uh, if you're a parent and you're here because you want to teach your kid to read well let's just hop into it right you've already got somebody to work with um if you're a teacher you're bound to have some kids who are struggling maybe you can ask one to help you out right and help you help you learn it by working with them um and if if worse comes to worse and you don't have anybody well then just get your partner or a friend to pretend to be a student for you so you can walk through the things and learn them. That's really important. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, thanks again. Uh, this video will be posted on, um, it won't be posted. It will be sent to you with next week's information. No, it will be posted. Mm. Just, I'll send it to you because I have your emails. And then next week after the next um, recording, we'll, would all, are we gonna send me, wait, how are we gonna do this? You're gonna send me stuff for this week? Or do you have anything for this week? Me? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, I wanted to give everybody the, a copy of the, do you want this to see, yes. see what Samantha did and my scoring? Yep. So okay. we can attach so that to the, that's what we'll do. Yeah, we'll attach that. Um, I don't have time to do it tonight. Oh, no worries. When do you need it by tomorrow? Because you want to send it out. Okay. All right. I'll get it to you sometime early tomorrow. Okay. So yeah. you folks hang tight. I'll get it to you um, sometime midday tomorrow or end of the day. Whenever Erin gets her stuff to me. Okay. <laughs> Whenever I can get myself. No pressure. Uh -huh. <laughs> no pressure. But, but All yeah, right. Good tomorrow. night, everybody. <laughs> good night. Have a good yeah. dinner.